Welcome to Dissecting Philosophy with Dr. McDonald. In this episode, we'll be rounding off the section of all the new law tables in Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, dealing with the sections 23 to 30. Dealing with quite an interesting set of topics of relationships, morality, and finding our own conviction and belief. So let's get started. Section 23. This is how I would have man and woman. The one fit for war, the other fit for bearing children, but both fit for dancing with head and heels. And let the day be lost to us on which we did not dance once. And let that wisdom be false to us that brought no laughter with it. So, section 23 then, very short in comparison to all the other little sections that we've done so far. And immediately we have the whole discussion about the roles of men and women. Man's role is for war and that of women for childbearing. And immediately we can be like, oh my god, is Nietzsche being completely stereotypical here fitting into this is the role I expect men to fit into this is the role I expect women to fit into what happens for instance when you have warrior women throughout history that completely clashes with the idea of solely being there just to bear children for instance and you could say well that's the given case But also, we have this interesting line rounding off 23. And let that wisdom be false to us that brought no laughter with him. So, in a way, it is kind of being humorous and making precisely fun of itself to say, well, when we think of these given things as being wise, it's making fun of those views that are to argue for such things in the first place that of course within given history there's people that's going to argue for those given roles that men have to do this and women have to do this but also we have with Nietzsche always that laughter and mockery of anything that's held up in such a high esteem to say well okay that might be true for your view but that doesn't necessarily hold for somebody else's view nor will that hold up historically because precisely going back into those historical examples again we can see that there's going to be different civilizations and approaches is going to clash precisely with what's ever held up as a wise thing for everybody to follow in the first place so it's in a way very short and very quick but what it's trying to say is again that whole point of well if you're just reading it just for that first line you'll miss everything that then Nietzsche's trying to say for it after that to say well you can try and argue for a given viewpoint but ultimately that viewpoint again as Nietzsche loves to do is only a temporary thing set to a very limited time period and that view will be overcome and challenged by other views so let's kick off into section 24 where we'll have a whole discussion about marriage and relationships your marriage contracting see it is not a bad contracting you have decided too quickly from that follows breakup of marriage And yeah, rather break up of marriage than bending of marriage, lying in marriage. A woman said to me, 
True, I have broke up my marriage, but first my marriage broke me up. I have always found the badly paired to be the most revengeful. They make everyone suffer for the fact they are no longer single. For that reason, I want honest people to say to one another, we love each other. Let us see to it that we stay in love, or shall our promise be a mistake? Allow us a term and a little marriage to see if we are fit for the great marriage. It is a big thing always to be with one another. Thus I console all honest people, and what would be my love for the Superman and everything to come if I should console and speak otherwise? To propagate yourselves not only forward but upward, may the garden of marriage assist you, O oh my brothers. So we have Nietzsche acting as a relationship counsellor for section 24 when we have this whole discussion about marriage and relationships. Because we have initially kicking off the section this whole discussion about rushing into marriage and people get married too quickly. And it's such a great line, the one where he says, a woman said to me, true, I broke up my marriage, but first my marriage broke me up. Because it's that whole thing of, well, we can be really intensely in a relationship with someone. We can even be with them for several months. And we think we found the absolute perfect person. But it's such a strange thing when you go into marriage as an institution because you would think, well, nothing changes in that given way. All that you've done is essentially sign a bit of paper, have the whole ceremony of the wedding and put the rings on and so on. Nothing technically has changed between either person in terms of the relationship. But it's always just interesting the way that seems to be that marriages can break relationships precisely through people having become married in the first place. And one of the ways that Nietzsche says is the problem of that is that once you have that whole intense relationship with each other, there's then that problem of, well, then they get married but then they become spiteful and revengeful, as he says, because they want to be single again. And because they want the whole aspect of being able to do what they want within their own free time and space and not having to make any compromises and so forth when you live with another person. And that's really what the big thing from the psychological aspect about what Nietzsche's picking up on relationships here is that when somebody's single, you're free to go about and do what you like. But when you're suddenly in that relationship, yeah, you're intensely in relationship, madly in love with each other, but it's the little things that's going to make up all the difference when it comes down to, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to have for dinner? What are you going to do together? And that continual thing of, well, are you going to always agree? Who's going to have to make that compromise in each given instance? Because it's that whole thing of, well, yeah, we have the whole thing about trying to find a, another person that's like us, that shares our interests. But it's always that point, well... Nobody's a clown. Nobody has exactly the same interests. But that's also what makes relationships fantastic is, well, nobody's exactly the same. And sometimes you get to appreciate the other person's love of a specific thing, like music or cooking or whatever thing that they're into, that you never really had that much an interest in before. That's one of the magics of the whole thing. But... When we go into marriage as the institution, then we have precisely, well, what happens when you feel psychologically like your freedom is starting to be taken away and no longer you can do what you like? And there's a good quote just 
popping into my head from actor Jude Law. I think he was on some sort of talk show and he was talking about relationships and he was specifically saying, oh, I need my space. I need to have a space, basically, where I'm able to do what I like and have time to myself. Because, of course, that is one of the key crux problems of the whole thing. And so Nietzsche, in his sort of agony ant type phase here in 24, then says, well, how do we start to get around this is a problem. Let's do a little marriage, which is to say, well, how about you try just moving in with each other first to see if you're precisely going to get on living with each other and you can get past this whole honeymoon phase or being blinded by your pure intensity in the relationship. Let's try and get towards the practical everyday situations that you're going to be facing. And if you can get around that in the little way, maybe then you'll be ready to get actually married in the long run because he says marriage is such a big step. And not only that, it's the whole prospect of having to spend every single day with the same person. Either that's going to be an absolute bliss to you or it's going to be a complete nightmare. And you've got to try and work out for yourself whether you want that in the first place with that particular person. And then it ends quite beautifully as well about just how after all that marriage is something that can quite uplift us as he says to propagate yourselves not only forward but upward may the garden of marriage assist you all my brothers it's just that whole uplifting nature of having another person there as well can not only uplift us in sense of just everyday life and enjoyment of precisely life but also just beneficial in terms of mental health, physical health, everything that all comes with it as well. So it's such an uplifting experience through having that relationship in the first place with another person. Section 25. He who has grown wise concerning old origins, behold, he will at last seek new springs of the future and new origins, Oh, my brothers, it will not be long before new peoples shall arise and new springs rush down into the depths. For the earthquake that blocks many wells and causes much thirst also brings to light inner powers and secret things. The earthquake reveals new springs. In the earthquake of ancient peoples, new springs break forth. And around him who cries, Behold! Here a well for many who are thirsty, one heart for many who long, one will for many instruments. Around him assembles a people, that is to say, many experimenters. Who can command, who can obey, that is experimented here? Alas, with what protracted searching and succeeding, and failing and learning and experimenting anew? Human society, that is an experiment, so I teach a long search. It seeks, however, the commander, an experiment, O oh my brothers, and not a contract. Shatter, shatter that expression of the soft-hearted and half and half. So straight from relationships into a discussion touching upon anthropology, and also a little bit of political philosophy. So, one of the main targets, or at least two of the main targets, within 25 as a section, is Thomas Hobbes, British empirical philosopher, which means that he bases everything very much upon our experience. And then, on the other hand, the other person getting targeted here is another philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So the key thing between Hobbes and Rousseau is that idea of a contract that he's touching upon here in 25. And the key thing 
in both their philosophies, for Hobbes's book Leviathan and in Rousseau's book Social Contract, is that they both have conflicting ideas about how society precisely emerged. But in both given instances, they have this idea of a contract that people, when they come together, metaphorically sign in order for them to be able to live together in the first place. So dealing with Hobbes then first, we have the whole idea of a sort of war of all against all and where everybody's very selfish and only acts in their own selfish interests. So how do you get around that is a problem. You've got to give up your rights and so on. And then what does emerge for Hobbes is the best form of society is a monarchical society. And so you have that famous picture of a king for representing the Leviathan precisely formed up by all the people that precisely give all their rights to the ruler and monarch in order for them to rule over everybody. And then on the other hand, we have Rousseau's idea of this state of nature, of this Lord of the Flies, such a good book as well for both situations, where Rousseau would argue that people would come together and act much more compassionately with everybody in that state of nature. And so, rather than having it in a monarchical style system, what do we end up with is a much more democratic style of government, in which there's a good quote here that says, Rousseau argued that the general will of the people could not be decided by elective representatives, so that would be in the form of a republic. Instead, he believed in a direct democracy in which everyone voted to express the general will of the people and to make the laws of the land. Rousseau had in mind a democracy on a small scale, a city-like state like his native Geneva. And so we've got then contrasting ideas about what would man be like and humanity be like in a state of nature one for Hobbes saying this explains why we end up in monarchy in a monarchical style government and on the other Rousseau has the opposite view to say well this is explains how we end up in a democratic idea however then you go on to the Nietzsche side of things you can say, well, one of the problems with the Hobbes and Rousseau idea is that it's quite romanticized and quite idealistic. And one of the benefits that Nietzsche has as well is the whole relation into anthropology. Because with anthropology, then you can start to analyze precisely past civilizations. And within that, as he says, what do you have is not precisely one clear-cut idea that either goes with monarchy or either goes with democracy. So the idea that you have in contrast is that human society is an experiment. And the ways in which human society has progressed over time is always in this flux in experimental form and so it's never clear cut and precise in every given instance throughout time that is always going to end up on precisely what form of government it is what laws are going to be in place and what's the justice system in place and so on what does time and anthropology allow us to see is all that flux. However, one of the things that Nietzsche does pick upon 
is a constant that remains within all this change is that there seems to be a move and a search for, as he says, the commander. And that goes back into the idea again for going against herd mentality and everybody thinking the same way. What do you end up in? Is either in a situation where you can be critical and have critical thought, challenge other people, or you just obey it. So you either end up in a commanding or obeying position. And here's where Nietzsche has the whole relation to, well, what do we search for as the great commanders? And it goes back into, again, the previous point that he makes. Within historical periods, you have humanity precisely flourish, like in the Roman Empire and so forth, and also decline based upon how good that leadership is in a given time, in a given period as well. And what do people want is to be led well. And if you're led well, what does that mean? Everybody else is allowed to flourish within that given society. And again, if you're led badly, everything's going to go into decline. But it's that whole search for what is the way that we can be led well is almost that consistent question, as he says, throughout human history as we go through it and trying to see, wow, this will be a way in which we can start to understand the question of why is there so much change? What is one of the key things within all these societies that they're going to be wanting? And within all that, they want to have that relationship into being led well, to flourish, to live the best life possible. But within all that, interestingly, you lead then precisely into diversity and lots of different approaches and not precisely just one overall arcing answer to that question. Moving on to the next section then. Section 26. Oh, my brothers, with whom does the greatest danger for the whole human future lie? Is it not with the good and just, with those who say and feel in their hearts, we already know what is good and just, we possess it too, woe to those who are still searching for it. And whatever harm the wicked may do, the harm the good do is the most harmful harm. And whatever harm the world calumniators may do, the harm the good do is the most harmful harm. O oh my brothers, someone who once looked into the heart of the good and just and said, They are the Pharisees, but he was not understood. The good and just themselves could not understand him. Their spirit is imprisoned in their good conscience. The stupidity of the good is unfathomably clever. But is the truth, the good have to be Pharisees. They have no choice. The good have to crucify him who devises his own virtue. That is the truth. But the second man to discover their country, the country, heart and soil of the good and just, was he who asked, Whom do they hate the most? They hate the Creator most, him who breaks the law tables, and old values, the breaker. They call him the lawbreaker, for the good cannot create. They are always the beginning of the end. They crucify him who writes new values on new law tables. They sacrifice the future to themselves. They crucify the whole human future, the good have always been the beginning of the end. And then this continues into section 27, so we might as well read that and have a good discussion of both. So section 27. Oh, my brothers, have you understood this saying too, and what I once said about the ultimate man? 
with whom does the greatest danger to the whole human future lie is it not with the good and just shatter shatter the good and just O oh, my brothers have you understood this saying too so initially when you may read that you may think it's counterintuitive because when you say there's a problem with the idea of doing something good it's automatically well isn't doing a good thing precisely good for another person and of course the answer to that is of course but what Nietzsche wants us to focus on here is again has that nice relation back into anthropology because whenever we think of good and evil at least in a traditional sense and I've said this in many different episodes by this point as well always in that pure sense that's what traditional philosophy loves to do good is pure evil is pure these big concepts you have your Luke Skywalker versus your Darth Vader and so on what's so good about what Nietzsche's making us think upon in sections 26 and 27 is to say well if you try to argue for an ethics or morality in the way that traditional philosophy does which is to set up a specific model in which these actions will always be good these actions will always be bad then you run precisely into the problems of anthropology coming back into you again because you can say well if we look at human civilization again and go back throughout history we precisely have that idea of a clash between what people think is good in a certain period and what people think is bad in another period and they could very well clash with each other and clash between civilizations and so on and the key to that of course is that it's always in change and always in flux and so that's the good point as well to affirm all that change because it allows our ideas precisely to change and allows different things to affect a law new things to come in to change it to amend it and so on what Nietzsche wants us to pick up on here then is to say well the good is the beginning of the end or those who seek to do always good is the beginning of the end because it goes back into that whole ideas there of always thinking that they're going to always do good in a given instance in a given situation and they don't see or think about on the deeper way on critical way of their own actions not only that but also the idea that they're going to uphold is somehow always going to be good at the same time so and then we have that love for the relation into well who do they hate who do they precisely hate is the people who come in and try to challenge those laws challenge the way that they think and challenge those ideas because they don't want those law tables to be shattered as he says they want them to be concrete in stone hung up in a way idolized and the danger that Nietzsche wants us to think upon here is because the ideas are focused upon an always and to try and be a one size fits all approach it precisely argues against diversity at the same time as it argues against change and so that's the main problems that we have when dealing with the traditional approaches for ethics and morality the Nietzsche is saying here that we want to precisely affirm diversity different approaches as well as 
the change within those approaches at the same time. Because if we don't, then you can put this into a nice political model of trying to argue for a totalitarian style of system where every single civilization will always have to adhere to this model by this person and this set of rules. And it's that question of could you imagine the absolute hell of that system where you couldn't challenge it, you couldn't change the laws, and you're absolutely stuck within the same thing, and nothing you do, nothing you say, nothing at all would be allowed to change it, amend it, and the absolute horror of that situation. And you end up in precisely more or less that totalitarian system where something's held up to the nth degree and you never want that for Nietzsche. Everything's always a sandcastle. And they have that wonderful idea elsewhere, I can't remember exactly where, that everything's basically is an idea as a sandcastle because you build it up and it can look fantastic as some of the sandcastles do, but what's going to happen is that it's going to wash away. And it's, you can see the fear that normally traditional philosophy has is that process of washing away because it doesn't want it to happen. Why not? Because it ultimately sees that whole process of washing away as, of course, destructive, but also a block to try and achieve knowledge and try and achieve any basis whatsoever. But Nietzsche's approach is to say, well, Yes, it's destructive, but it's also creative. It also allows for fresh approaches to emerge. It also affirms all that diversity. Like we said last episode as well, it allows for all that newness. Section 28. Do you flee from me? Are you frightened? Do you tremble at this thing? Oh, my brothers... When I bade you shatter the good and the law tables of the good, only then did I embark mankind upon its high seas. And only now does the great terror, the great prospect, the great sickness, the great disgust, the great seasickness come to it. The good taught you false shores and false securities. You were born and kept in the lies of the good. Everything has been distorted and twisted down to its very bottom through the good. But he who discovered the country of man also discovered the country of human future. Now you shall be seafarers, brave, patient seafarers. Stand up straight in good time, O oh my brothers. Learn to stand up straight. The sea is stormy. Many want to straighten themselves again by your aid. The sea is stormy. Everything is at sea. Well then, come on, you old seamen hearts. What of fatherland? Our helm wants to fare away, out to where our children's land is, out away more stormy than the sea. Storms are great longing. 28 then we have this whole fantastic image that Nietzsche gives us of, well, what happens once you let go of a certain idea? Then comes in immediately the psychological effect and the effect precisely on our mental health when we say, well, once you lose all that ground, then what does it provide is comfort and security. But then you take the rug away from under your feet, as the saying would go, and what you left with is something uncertain and would make you uneasy. And he's even saying, well, in that given instance, what are we like when we're in this search for a new idea is like a sailor on the sea and it's not a nice sea it's a stormy sea and we have then tying into this whole search for newness 
that simultaneous sickness and unease that comes with it at the same time. It's not something that's pleasant. It's not something that's joyful. In fact, can make us feel really unwell because suddenly there's no security anymore. But that's okay, as he says, because even the journey itself can be absolutely terrible on the stormy sea. And even though we're going to be feeling terrible, seasickness and so on, that's absolutely fine because where we're going is ultimately to those uncharted lands. And like great explorers, we're not only going to go discover and try and find new things, but also, it's going to be where the children's land is. And this is, again, another thing that keeps popping up as an idea. Newness and the future is in relation to children. And so, whatever we then develop as a new idea and approach and so on, is then going to have that effect upon future generations at the same time. And it's quite interesting as he says, rounding off the section, out a way more stormy than the sea, storms are great longing. It's almost like we long for that storm, as he says, because that's when all the good stuff happens. That's when all the creativity emerges. That's when all the law tables can be shattered. That's when all the different perspectives and so forth come out, all within this state of being in this stormy sea. And we want to long for that process. So, continuing on to 29. Why so hard, the charcoal once said to the diamond, for are we not close relations? Why so soft, O oh my brothers? Thus I ask you, for... Are you not my brothers? Why so soft, so unresisting and yielding? Why is there so much denial and abnegation in your hearts? So little fate in your glances. And if you will not be fates, if you will not be inexorable, how can you conquer with me? And if your hardness will not flash and cut and cut to pieces, how can you one day create with me? For creators are hard, and it must seem bliss to you to press your hand upon millennia as upon wax, bliss to write upon the will of millennia as upon metal, harder than metal, nobler than metal. Only the noblest is perfectly hard. This is the new law table do I put over you, O oh my brothers. Become hard. Section 29, we have this discussion with a piece of charcoal and the diamond. So the whole section is to then build upon the previous one, where you had that search in the sea, and it was stormy, and you're looking for an idea, a completely brand new idea that you're going to create. And so... 29 is then talking about the psychology of this. In order for any creation to take place, as he's saying, there needs to be a conviction and belief in what you're saying for your argument. And so what do you not want is all those opposing qualities that he highlights. Not to be unresisting and yielding, not having lots of denial, not to be in self-denial. What do you need is all the opposite qualities of that. Because then, if you were to just resist and yield, then you're not given a really good, strong argument to what your position is in the first place. And so it just goes into all those nice points whenever someone's going to try and make a nice argument about whatever given viewpoint that it is, 
then they need to have the belief in conviction what they're saying as well as all the good stuff that backs up what they're saying and for them not to at any given point try and yield to the opposition so let's say in a nice debate situation you may have nice one position over the other and it'll go nice and back and forth and that's where we want to get to is that psychological state and having that mentality of being able to stand there and argue for your point moving on to the last section then section 30 oh my will my essential my necessity dispeller of need preserve me from all petty victories oh my soul's predestination which i call destiny in me over me preserve and spare me for a great destiny and your last greatness my will save for your last that you may be inexorable in your victory ah who has not succumbed to his own victory ah whose eye has not dimmed in this intoxicated twilight ah whose foot has not stumbled and in victory forgotten how to stand that i may one day be ready and ripe in the great noontide ready and ripe like glowing ore like cloud heavy with lightning and like swelling milk udder ready for myself and my most secret will a bow eager for its arrow an arrow eager for its star a star ready and ripe in its noontide glowing transpierced blissful through annihilating sun arrows a sun itself and an exorable sun will ready for annihilation in victory o will my essential my necessity dispeller of need spare me for one great victory thus spoke zarathustra rounding off with section 30 then we just have this lovely discussion all about how good it is to have that feeling of victory and achievement in the end of it all so it's nice how we have this whole movement from shattering law tables to being in a stormy sea to then trying to have our own belief to finally having that enjoyment in the victory of our new idea or whatever we've created and the pleasure precisely in that creation as he says ah whose eye has not dimmed in this intoxicated twilight whose foot has not stumbled and in victory forgotten how to stand it's that so much caught up in your own enjoyment and pleasure and affirmation of the whole process that you then are ready to be picked like a fresh fruit or in quite an interesting metaphor when the idea becomes ripe like a glowing ore or like a cow's swelling udder ready to produce all that wonderful milk for everybody else to go and enjoy and then from all that what is quite interesting is when you have that relation into the part at the end when you have that whole relation into a bow and an arrow shooting and so on then it says a sun itself and an inexorable sun will ready for annihilation in victory that little line there is so interesting in the sense of when you have all that process and then you have all the enjoyment through the creation peoples then took upon that then it's to be washed away again then it's going to be 
annihilated and then that just goes back into the whole process that Nietzsche has as well for our ideas and for the whole creative process it's not something that should be or any particular person upheld as oh isn't this a lovely thing that we've plucked and taken in and enjoyed it's almost like Nietzsche has this fantastic relationship between when you really love something it's like enjoying really nice food whatever it be and then you just indulge and gorge yourself on it can't get enough give me more of it and that's the whole point is that people tend to get caught up and it's so good and you get so caught up in it you want more and more and more and so that's the time when you say well I may have enjoyed that, but I need to be ready to enjoy something else. It's almost having a metaphor of life being like a buffet. And all of what we would get is if we just ate from the same buffet all the time, be for whatever style of food it is, wouldn't that just make life so much more boring? Wouldn't life be so much more exciting if we went to try different styles of food different things and so on and that's the whole point when we have this relation into the annihilation and this movement into well now that people have enjoyed this idea now we need to move on now we need to try something else enjoy something else but also as he rounds off is spare me for one great victory give me that sense of enjoyment of having everybody enjoy my ideas which then touches upon nicely of Nietzsche's own life and within his own time period people not really enjoying his ideas or books that much but post his death of course very much so and so everybody has that great enjoyment of Nietzsche so that manages to wrap up the section of old and new law tables in the next episode we'll be getting on to the section the convalescent so many thanks for listening to the episode i hope you enjoyed my discussion of the sections 23 to 30 of the overall section of old and new law tables in Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Feel free to check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash dissecting philosophy. Feel free to drop me a question at my email address, dissectingphilosophy at gmail.com. You could also tip me a coffee at ko-fi.com forward slash dissecting philosophy. And lastly, I can be found on Twitter at I am a rubber man. Many thanks for listening and I hope you'll join me next time.